Okay, so it's, uh, it's quite appropriate for me to be talking here um, about the madness of King George because this is a project that was actually funded by the Wellcome Trust uh, quite a number of years ago, uh, but we keep getting sort of minor updates on it as we go on. Um, and I think it, it's relevant because it's, it's sort of something that you wouldn't sort of normally think in terms of what you might apply science to do, at least it wasn't uh, back when we started this. But I think what it's, it's all part of is, is, is trying to you know, you, you're, you're sort of limited in terms of what you do in science by your imagination. And there's so many wonderful things that can be done that really the more you think about it, uh, the more exciting it gets. Okay, let me move on a bit. Okay, so if we talk about uh, royal diseases, we, we generally think in terms of uh, two things. Um, one of those is the madness associated with King George III. So there's a very famous play and film written by Alan Bennett uh, called The Madness of King George. And that tells the story of uh, George III's illness and, and more spe specifically an episode called The Regency Crisis uh, where the king was uh, nearly replaced by his uh, eldest son. And uh, the, his madness is, is thought to have been uh, associated with an inherited metabolic disorder called porphyria. You're going to learn a lot more about that in the next few slides. But the other uh, disorder that's always associated with the royal family is haemophilia. And uh, haemophilia, in fact, is a textbook, uh, with Queen Victoria anyway, is, is a sort of textbook example of what's known as an X-linked uh, in, inherited disorder. So uh, people who suffer with uh, haemophilia uh, generally tend to be males and, and uh, women tend to be carriers. And Queen Victoria, there is no doubt, was a carrier of the disorder and she passed it into both the Russian and Spanish royal families with disastrous consequences. Now, it's, it, it's, it's particularly apt to be talking about uh, royal disorders and uh, the effects of royal disorders um, because they, they really have uh, quite a sort of political uh, um, uh, 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 scenario with them. And uh, bearing in mind we're coming up to, or we've just had our own Brexit uh, vote, we've got the American elections. Actually looking back retrospectively as to how major historical events have been influenced by people who have uh, diseases um, uh, is, is quite pertinent. So uh, I'm going to have to apologise initially because you are going to get a bit of a history lesson. You came here to learn a bit of science. I'm going to give you history. Um, but I'm also going to introduce you some of, to one of my key research areas, which are the pigments of life, and I'll tell you about those. And then uh, we'll finish up with porphyry and the madness of King George and, and uh, what we've learned about that and, and uh, what it really tells us. And of course, uh, everybody should keep their phones uh, well <laughs> quiet and down, and, uh, apart from key organisers. <clears throat> okay. So, royalty, disease, and history. Uh, so... If we look at George III, George III was actually on the throne for about 60 years, from 1860 to 1820. Uh, although for the last 10 years he, he, he was largely suffering with dementia, was kept in the, in the, uh, in the Round Tower at Windsor Castle. But uh, he was one of the country's longest uh, sovereigns, um, and uh, his influence was, was quite remarkable. Now, during his, his reign, of course, uh, whilst he was on the throne, um, we lost the American colonies. Some can argue that's a good thing. Some could argue that's a bad thing. Uh, but he certainly took it very personally. And he, he berated himself because uh, he felt that he was king, he was supreme uh, leader, and therefore the loss of the American colonies was really down to, down to him. As I said, that's not really such a bad idea. I mean, we used to use the American colonies as, as a place to dump all our criminals after we lost the American colonies. We still had Australia, so we used to dump them down there. Uh, after Australia got wise to that trick, we joined the EU and we dumped them all down to Spain. Now we're out of the EU. I'm not quite sure where we're going to dump them. But there's no doubt that, uh, uh, that uh, the royal family have had influences on, on a whole range of major events. Uh, and also... Um, if we were to look at the grandsons of, uh, uh, of Queen Victoria, we've got uh, Wilhelm, uh, George V, and uh, Tsar Nicholas, uh, who, as cousins, really were in power at the time of the start of World War I. And one wonders to what extent, perhaps, what their background was uh, 
whether that influenced them in some of the key decisions that were being made at that time for such a disastrous conflict, uh, and which ultimately also led to the start of World War II. So trying to understand a little bit more about the background, if we can understand even from a sort of medical perspective as to what might have been wrong with some of these rulers, uh, uh, can give us an insight in, in, into uh, uh, how we can look at these things uh, um, retrospectively. So my research is actually focused on these um, molecules uh, that are referred to as the pigments of life. So I'm interested in, in chlorophyll, which is why grass is green. I'm interested in heme, which is why blood is red. I'm not the first person to have pondered these thoughts. Um, uh, I've quoted here uh, Sir Walter Raleigh from 1614 when he was actually locked up uh, for treason. And he was writing a brief history of the world and he quoted, man cannot give a true reason for the grass under his feet why it should be green rather than red or any other color. Uh, fortunately, we can actually give quite a detailed molecular explanation these days. Uh, um, uh, and that really just uh, really highlights uh, our, our scientific advances. So this is um, a picture of a model plant. This is uh, Arabidopsis thaliana. And like all plants, uh, it's green because it's uh, full of chlorophyll. And chlorophyll does the most amazing reaction on the planet. It's the most important reaction on the planet. And in essence, what it's able to do is it's able to focus sunlight and convert that into chemical energy. And that, what it does is it, it, it effectively traps the sunlight, focuses it into a reaction center, and that reaction center is a lump of, uh, uh, of uh, manganese. And that manganese is then able to uh, oxidize water, so you produce oxygen and hydrogen. The hydrogen is where the energy is. The oxygen is liberated, which is why plants give off oxygen. And then that, the, the plant has to store that hydrogen, and it stores it in the form of sugar. So in terms of photosynthesis, it's a key reaction that keeps all, all life on the planet going forward. Nature has evolved this uh, amazing process where it's able to use this chlorophyll molecule to harness the light energy and convert that into chemical energy in the form of, uh, of sugar. And uh, one of the key things we're interested in is, is how nature is able to make a molecule such as chlorophyll. And can we make derivatives of chlorophyll that might be even better or can be used for different purposes? Related to chlorophyll is this uh, heme molecule. Heme molecule is found in hemoglobin. Hemoglobin constitutes about 80% of a red blood cell. And heme, Rather than using the whole molecule to, to do the process, the, the heme is really a cage, and it's a cage to trap iron. And it's the chemistry of iron that's so important. And heme is used for a variety of different biological processes in, uh, in nature. It's used, obviously, in the blood to help transport uh, 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 gases such as oxygen, carbon dioxide. But it's also used in a whole range of different catalytic processes um, uh, in, in terms of trying to get rid of toxic compounds from the body through to sensing and a whole range of other processes. And the difference between heme and chlorophyll, isn't it? And, and the reason why heme is red is because if you look at all of these sort of double bonds around the periphery of the molecule, but when you get a whole range of double bonds together, this sort of chemical conjugation, you get a, a redder and redder color. And because there's so many double bonds present in the heme molecule, it's very red. If you go back to the chlorophyll molecule, you'll see that this position here, there is no double bond. And without that double bond there, the conjugation isn't quite so uh, connected, which is why chlorophyll is green. So that answers Sir Walter Raleigh's question. So King George III, as I said, he was on the throne for uh, uh, 60 years. And whilst he was on the throne, he suffered with a number of bouts of illness. And those uh, from his early times on the throne and uh, uh, from 1762, which were effectively uh, just uh, something that appeared like stomach ache with a cold, through to the 1788-89 episode, which is the Regency crisis, where he had similar kinds of abdominal pains, uh, uh, bad constipation, he suffered with peripheral neuropathy, which means that he struggled to move his limbs properly, he lacked a, a coordination, he couldn't sleep, he had a rapid pulse. And then for a period of about a month or so, he actually 
completely went mad. He became insane. And just when they were about to replace him, he regained his, his, his mind, and, uh, and he apparently became cured. But then a few years later, he had similar kinds of bouts of, of this sort of illness, this temporary illness, which, which resulted in, in, in a period of, of temporary madness. And uh, so historians have been trying to look at look, somebody's poster down. Um, <coughs> Uh, people have been trying to understand what was wrong with, uh, with King George and, and, and trying to, to get a, a, a better feel for what the cause of that, uh, his medical condition was. And this is a brief clip from uh, a documentary made a few years ago. This part. This part. Having ruled England for almost 30 years without any mental embarrassment, in 1788, the behavior of King George III crossed the delicate line between eccentricity and madness. I'm obliged to you, madam. Come, stop now. On England, on! Among many other strange changes noticed in the king was the color of his urine. Look, it's blue. Do not hear what the king has It's the king's water, sir. It's blue, sir. So? Well, it's been this color since this business began. The business had brought upon the 50-year-old king a complex attack of agonizing abdominal pains, neurological problems, and dark urine that left a purple residue. By the fourth week of illness, his life hung in the balance. Following a profound stupor, he seemed to recover his physical health, but in the process appeared to have lost his mind. Some ascribe the king's derangement to the strain of having married one of the ugliest of the available German princesses. Others to the torment of having sired 15 children by her, only to produce an heir to the throne who was a drug-addicted, alcoholic, womanizing glutton who openly discussed seizing power at his father's expense. Nobody quite knew what was wrong with him. He was sleepless, he talked a great deal, he became fairly violent and irritable. And naturally, people thought, oh, there's something physically wrong with him. They said it was rheumatism, et cetera, et cetera. And then he became more and more delirious, more and more impossible, more and more irritable. And eventually, one of the royal physicians, Richard Warren, writes in his diary, in the discreet obscurity of Latin, Rex Noster Insanit, our king has gone mad. Ignoring the significance of the color of the king's urine, in fact, a dark purple rather than blue, the king's doctors focused instead on his excreta. Good news, a fetid and a stinking stool. You see, who'd want to be a medic, eh? <clears throat> okay, so what was wrong with George III? Well, after he had died, of course, people then started to ask the question, why, why did he go mad? What was the problem with him? And his first initial, uh, initial uh, retrospective diagnoses were actually carried out by American psychologists, and the first of those was uh, in 1865 uh, by Isaac Ray, who suggested that the king was suffering with mania, that is, he just suffered with, with a form of madness. And then in 1945, uh, that uh, uh, mania was updated by uh, Isaac Guttmacher, who suggested that the king was suffering with depressive psychosis. Uh, in other words, as he was put under a certain amount of pressure, so he uh, lost his mind. And then in the, in the late 1960s, there was a, a German-born mother and son team, Ida McAlpine and Richard Hunter, who actually looked at the king's illnesses and said, actually, every time the king went mad, just before he went mad, those, those, uh, th that madness bite was, was ushered in by a number of physical symptoms. And those physical symptoms included that abdominal pain, uh, that, that peripheral neuropathy. And they, they said, actually, we don't recognize that as being mad, a, a, a form of madness. We recognize that as being a, a, a form of a rare metabolic disease called acute intermittent porphyria. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, the, the symptoms of porphyria uh, are, 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 are kind of complicated and, and, and easy to miss, which is why perhaps it hadn't been diagnosed uh, or recognized earlier. So what is porphyria and, and what is the, the cause of it? Well, to, to, to understand that, you've really got to understand a little bit about how that red pigment heme is made. 
and uh, the red pigment is made uh, in humans through a metabolic pathway that involves seven different enzymes. So we start with a small molecule, a minor levulinic acid, and that uh, a minor levulinic acid is acted upon by seven enzymes that convert the minor levulinic acid firstly into a pyrrole, porphyrolinogen, then into a linear tetrapyrrole, something called a hydroxymethyl bilane, uh, through uh, an, another molecule called uroporphyrinogen 3. We try and think of as complicated names as possible when we work on metabolism, so it's more difficult for the students to remember. But eventually, you end up with heme. So there are seven enzymes, seven steps in, in, in making that red pigment. Now, with seven uh, enzymes and seven genes, we know that there are mutations in every one of those genes that can give rise to a metabolic disorder. And when you are missing uh, a certain amount of those enzymes, you get a buildup of metabolites in the pathway. And those metabolites give rise to porphyria. And so with seven separate uh, genes, there are seven separate porphyrias. There are seven distinct porphyrias. And each of them has slightly different symptoms. So a defect in that first enzyme gives rise to something called uh, ALA dehydratase porphyria. A defect in the second enzyme gives rise to something called acute intermittent porphyria, which is what Ida McAlpine and Richard Hunter initially thought was wrong with King George. A defect in the next enzyme gives rise to something called congenital erythroetic uh, porphyria. In the fourth enzyme, something called porphyria cutanea tarda. In the fifth enzyme, something called uh, HCP, uh, hereditary coproporphyria. Uh, uh, a defect in the sixth enzyme gives something called variegate porphyria. And a defect in the seventh enzyme gives rise to something called erythropoietic protoporphyria. I think I need a round of applause for remembering every single one of those. Thank you very much. OK, so every, for every defect, uh, you, there's normally you're missing an enzyme. We normally get an enzyme, effectively, one from our mother, one from our father. Our bodies can cope with, with two enzymes working on the pathway. But if we lose one of those enzymes, then we start to build up these intermediates. And those intermediates, a bit like if you have a, a, a lane closure on a motorway, all of a sudden you get a lot of congestion. The traffic can still get through, but it's a lot slower, and you get a buildup of things uh, uh, where the lane closure is. So you get a bottleneck, and that's that bottleneck effect where you build up all of these intermediates which aren't normally there, which causes the problems and causes the illness. So, uh, it's a def so porphyria is really a deficiency in one of those heme biosynthetic enzymes. It's accumulation of those pathway intermediates that causes the problems because they're toxic. And the symptoms that uh, the king or anybody or a patient suffers are dependent on which intermediates uh, 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 accumulate. <laughs> and those clinical symptoms uh, are, are rarely divided into two major classes. There are neurological symptoms because a buildup of that first intermediate in the pathway, monolivulinic acid, interferes with the autonomic nervous system. And so things like your, the peristalsis that happens in your gut, that will stop, which is why people with uh, porphyria suffer with these severe abdominal pains, because their guts are no longer trying to move food along, and so they become remarkably turgid in their, in their stomach. And it's, it, the pains have been described as being worse than labor pains. Uh, they have this general muscle weakness. They can have a problem, uh, a, a, a psychiatric disturbance. And also some of those bigger molecules, those things that look like a heme but aren't quite a heme molecule, they, they act a bit like the chlorophylls. They start to absorb all of that light energy outside and they, 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 they'll absorb the light energy and then they'll fluoresce and, and they, they then react with molecular oxygen and cause all kinds of radical chemistry. And so if you go out in bright sunlight and you've got a, some of those big molecules floating around in your blood system, they will, they'll blister your arms, you become incredibly photosensitive. And so people who suffer with porphyria quite often have to stay in darkened rooms. And, uh, and it's really quite, quite a difficult thing to, 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 um, to overcome. But the real telltale symptom is that a lot of these intermediates are colored. And so uh, when you, uh, and uh, because you, you accumulate a lot of colored intermediates, those get excreted in your urine or in your stool. And so therefore your urine can appear quite dark red or even be so dark red it's almost black in appearance. Uh, and so that's a real telltale symptom. And all of those symptoms were recorded for George III. And what we wondered was whether it would be possible to really prove that George III suffered with uh, a form of porphyria by going ahead and, and trying to exhume him. 
and, uh, and then do some DNA analysis uh, uh, on, on, uh, on, on his remains. And uh, uh, actually, George III is buried just about there on the floor of St. George's Chapel in Windsor. And when we asked politely whether we could uh, come in with a pickaxe and dig the floor up, they said no, there was a try a lottery ticket, there was more chance of that happening. So it was obvious that we were never going to get permission to, to, to get uh, George III. But actually, because it's a hereditary illness, this illness is passed through the family. And there were, the, uh, there were a number of branches of the family which also appeared to have people who suffered with porphyria. And this is uh, Queen Victoria uh, and her eldest daughter, Vicky, and her eldest uh, daughter, Charlotte, and her only child, Theodora. And Theodora and Charlotte wrote a lot of letters in, to, to each other and to their mother, Vicky. And in those letters, they described a whole range of symptoms, including abdominal pain, photosensitivity, uh, dark urine, all of the things that are, that are associated with porphyria. And so we, we wondered whether we would be able to get permission to exhume the remains of Theodora and, and uh, uh, Char uh, Charlotte uh, to see if we could find a mutation in those remains that uh, would help demonstrate that there really was porphyria in the royal family. And so uh, through collaboration with our historian colleague, John Rowe, we got permission to uh, exhume uh, Charlotte, who's the sister of Kaiser Wilhelm. Um, uh, we also got DNA from uh, Princess Theodora. That's her remains down there. Uh, and, and from that, we were able to demonstrate that uh, when we analyzed those uh, uh, remains, we were able to find a genetic change which was consistent with variegate porphyria. Uh, it's not actually conclusive. But we were able to do quite a lot of analysis on that. If we really wanted to prove it, we would actually have to have a living relative. But there's a little video clip here. It'll kick in eventually. It's a little bit of a delay between uh, when this starts and the, and the sound. I'm just describing about how we got hold of um, Charlotte's DNA. It was a great moment. I think something like two years of negotiation culminated in that opening of the grave. The casket itself was undamaged except for a very small um, tear in the top of it which had been caused by uh, rainfall dripping for 90 years, nearly 90 years on top of it. But otherwise we could be assured that these were indeed um, the remains of Princess Charlotte that had not been interfered with at all, not been contaminated in any way. One of the workmen dropped down into the crypt and he took a pair of uh, metal clippers. Uh, around this small hole, he cut uh, a six inch by six inch hole. He took a torch and we shone the torch and we looked into the hole and um, there in the coffin was this, this perfectly preserved uh, skeleton. Okay. So, I mean, from all of that, we were fairly convinced that uh, the, the king really uh, did suffer with, uh, with porphyria because all the, the, the uh, evidence that we had found, including the fact that uh, uh, a cousin of uh, the current Queen Elizabeth II had also been diagnosed, diagnosed with porphyria, although it hadn't been sort of made public. So the general question then that we wanted to address was, wasn't so much whether George III had porphyria, because in, in my mind he clearly did, but why did he have it so comparatively uh, at such a late stage in his life, because he was about 50 years old when he had his first really major attack, where he, where he, where he suffered with the, 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 the mental problems. And so we wonder whether it was actually due to the treatment that the king was receiving at the time. And um, so we then, uh, at this stage, we were contacted by the Science Museum, who actually had a locket of hair that belonged to the Wellcome Trust, the, the Wellcome Collection. And this hair now, sample is now in the... Um, in, in the main, in the other built, in the other welcome building, in, in in the main exhibition there. And they said, we got this hair sample. Um, uh, would this be of use to your study? And so we looked at the hair sample. We tried to get DNA out of it. It's actually remarkably difficult to get DNA out of hair. But we thought we could look to see if there were any sort of heavy metals. We thought maybe he might have been poisoned with a bit of uh, mercury or lead. So we did a, 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 a metal analysis on the hair. Actually, what we found was it was a little bit of mercury and a bit of lead, but what we really found was a huge amount of arsenic. And actually, arsenic to people who suffer with porphyria actually makes their condition an awful lot worse. And we were able to, and this is on a logarithmic scale, 
we took a whole range of volunteers and we looked at their hair uh, and, and did an analysis of the different uh, arsenic levels you would find in it and then we compared that to George's hair and this is a logarithmic scale so it's about a thousand times more arsenic in his hair than in, 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 uh, uh, in, in normal individuals and that combined with the fact that um, he suffered with porphyria made it most likely that as they were trying to give him treatment to try and unblock him they were giving him uh, um, antimony based medicines to try and purge his system because the system was blocked so they were trying to, to, to make things move one way or the other uh, but that medicine uh, was largely contaminated the way they produced antimony was, uh, uh, was through a crystallization procedure which meant that there was coming through with about 10% of arsenic as well and best we were able to look at the medical records to see how much the king was being given and best on those records we were able to estimate that the king was receiving about 2.5 milligrams of arsenic a day which very nearly killed him and most likely explained why he suffered with porphyria attacks so much later on in life. Okay, I've had my full time. I better stop now. I've got to acknowledge the help and support of, uh, of uh, Her Majesty the Queen, who gave us permission to do all kinds of things with, uh, with various uh, royal records. Um, I've got to acknowledge John Rule, who was a great help, and David Hunt at, uh, at uh, UCL, uh, and, and people like Tim Cox, uh, and... Uh, uh, you all for listening so thank you very much any questions Anybody? there's a couple down here hello there um, when you uh, analysed the DNA from, was it Charlotte and Theodora, did yeah. you look at any other genes uh, to do with the, um, the biochemistry or the, uh, the biochemical pathways? Uh, we, in, in essence, we looked at two, we, we had two candidate genes which were for two different types of porphyria. So we only looked at those two. Um, this was a few years ago uh, when it was more difficult to do the DNAs ex DNA extractions and so on. So um, we really ought to go back and do a complete analysis. But... Uh, uh, the, the mutation that we find was very much with the protoporphyrinogen oxidase gene, um, which gives rise to variegate porphyria. There's one down here. Um, I was wondering if the pain was unbearable, which led to his psychiatric attacks, or was it something else? Any chemicals which led to his attacks? So it's um, so he, so generally with with porphyria, the, the patients will suffer. They'll, they'll they'll have these neurological symptoms which will build up, and so that includes the severe abdominal pain. So I guess your question was: Was the pain so severe that that just triggered uh, a, a mental imbalance? Well, actually, the, generally what happens is that the, you get those uh, abdominal pains, and then those pass. And then the, the, you get further psychological disturbance. And so he, he certainly seemed to uh, have overcome the, uh, the abdominal pains that he had. And then he lost his mind for approaching three months. Um, and that's not unusual uh, with some porphyria patients. And uh, uh, you get a whole range of things that happen, including uh, hallucinations. So George III famously, for instance, went and greeted a tree thinking it was Frederick the Great. And, um, uh, and he also went lusting after uh, a number of ladies of waiting uh, who, were in, uh, who were looking after the Queen. And so you get a whole range of quite unusual and unconnected mental symptoms um, which, which really arise from quite a severe imbalance of, of, of neurotransmitters. And if any other symptom was cured, would the rest still remain there? So actually, uh, the best way for, to treat porphyric patients is to prevent them develop, uh, develop uh, to prevent certain triggers from making the, uh, uh, causing con the condition in the first place. So there are no known cures for porphyria at the moment, although there are some, some interesting gene therapy things coming through the pipeline at the moment. But um, in essence, if uh, the porphyria attacks are worse when you stimulate that heme biosynthetic pathway. So if you, for instance, had a, had a lot of bleeding, then you, your body has to make a lot more heme, 
and so therefore that pathway gets stimulated. So if you can prevent uh, sort of episodes of bleeding, then you, you can sort of uh, overcome those effects. Similarly, uh, another area where you need a lot of heme is, is are in certain metabolic enzymes that break down foreign substances. So if you take um, a whole range of different drugs, those get go to the liver. The liver then says, oh, I recognize these as foreign. I'm going to have to make a, a, a bunch more cytochrome P450 to detoxify all of those. That stimulates heavily the heme pathway. So just taking certain drugs will stimulate the pathway. As soon as you stimulate that heme pathway, you get a buildup of those intermediates, and those intermediates are what cause the, the, the porphyria symptoms. So you've really got to try and find a way of, of calming down that heme pathway, which is what people are trying to work on.